The right to vote. Will you exercise your right this year to select a president, senators, U.S. representatives, and state legislators? Until 1920, women didn't have the right to cast a ballot, at least according to the federal government. Today, find out why Idaho was actually a quarter century ahead of its time, and how the Gem State is celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage this year. Plus, they were Americans, citizens of the United States. But after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, our government rounded them up and put them in incarceration camps, one of those camps in Idaho. A new traveling exhibit at the Idaho State Museum tells the story, Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans and World War II, ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. August 18th, 1920. The date the states ratified the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote. The amendment's wording gets right to the point. It's pretty short, too. It says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce, enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, the Idaho State Historical Society has big plans to celebrate 100 years of women's suffrage throughout this year. They're calling it the 2020 Idaho Women 100 Initiative. But did you know women in Idaho could vote long before the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920? Idaho approved a state constitutional amendment in 1896, giving women the right to vote here. We're going to talk about all of this today. My guests are Idaho State Historical Society Director Janet Gallimore on the right and new Idaho State Historian Hannah Laurie Hine as well. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Thank, thank you, Doug. You. All right, so Janet, first of all, what is Idaho Women 100? Well, Doug, a couple of years ago, we worked with the Idaho legislature to invite people to start thinking about and planning for the commemorative activities that would support the idea of commemorating women's right to vote. And so for the last two years, the State Historical Society, Idaho Women in Leadership, the AAUW, many universities and statewide partners have been working on all types of commemorative activities, exhibits, publications, and what have you. And we launched this year on March 13th. And what's the goal of it? What do you hope to accomplish through it? Well, as with most of our initiatives, we want to use history as a bridge to the, uh, uh, to the past, but reflecting on what that means for our future. So the goal of this initiative is to advance women's leadership in the future in terms of education, politics, business, the arts, all different uh, disciplines, and to encourage women to vote. And I have a list um, that I can put up on the screen of just a few of the events that are getting started basically now or soon <laughs> that we can show. Um, right now, people can visit the Idaho's first first family exhibit in Statuary Hall in the Capitol building. In the garden level wing of the state capitol, now through April, is Miss Fletcher's Botany Expedition. Um, at the state archives, visitors can check out the Women in Government free exhibit. Um, it's also one of four rotating exhibits that will be there presented throughout the year. Then, as you mentioned, the big kickoff and the bell ringing for the Idaho Women 100 initiative is March 13th at noon on the state capitol steps. There's also going to be a concurrent resolution declaring Idaho Women's Day. And then in June, um, one of the cool things is the book Numbered will be available. It tells the stories of women and inmates at the old penitentiary. So you explained what the goal of it is, but what do you want Idahoans to get from being able to experience these archives, these exhibits, the different events that are going to be going on throughout the year? Well, I think the common theme throughout uh, much of these activities is that women and men who supported them in terms of getting the vote really had a deep conviction for justice, for equality, for all people, for understanding that everyone has um, equal rights and, and that determination and that really uh, deep conviction and perseverance over time is what makes social change. And I think what we want to do is be sure that we illustrate the past, show what's happened for the, you know, on the, on the shoulders of those who came before us, and then that really is inspiration for our future. Okay, Hannah Laurie, um, how big was the women's suffrage movement here in Idaho pre-1920? So our movement was really uh, kind of a grassroots effort, I would say. So it was big, but in an isolated sense. So throughout southern Idaho, you had Mormon strongholds that were really supportive of the suffrage effort, um, and that dated as early as the 1870s. Uh, in fact, we had territorial efforts to introduce a bill into the territorial legislature to extend suffrage to women 
um, in 1870. Uh, and the representative that put that bill forward uh, argued that, much like Jan said, that, that the suffrage and equal rights was vital to kind of the success and development of Idaho as a territory and hopefully as, as a state moving forward. And so that effort ended up dying in a tie, unfortunately. But I think that really speaks to the, the strength that the movement had early on um, and through the 1880s and 1890s, it continued that way. And as I mentioned, 1896, Idaho, ratified, approved its own state constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote here 24 years ahead of the 1920-19th Amendment mm -hmm. ratification. Why was Idaho so far ahead of the curve, the fourth state of all the states to give women the right to vote, and I believe the first by constitutional amendment? Correct. Why was Idaho so far ahead? Well, I think moving out to the West and knowing that the landscape and the existence here in this area was rugged and hard, women had an opportunity to exist within the family structure and within the community structure here that they maybe did not have on the East Coast or even in the kind of Great Plains you know, area. Mm -hmm. So I think that had a lot to do with why women got the vote in the West first. Uh, we had been doing the work and it was recognized. Could women vote in federal elections in Idaho pre-1920? Correct. So in, they could. They could. So with the constitutional amendment that came in 1896, that allowed women to vote on the same ballot that men voted on. And so the first uh, presidential election that they were able to vote on was in 1900. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then so shortly after 1896, women were able to start serving in in elected office too, mm -hmm. right? And there were some pretty successful ones. Yes, so leading up to that constitutional amendment here in Idaho, uh, we had a, a local organization, kind of a statewide organization called Idaho Equal Suffrage Association. And that organization encouraged all four of Idaho's political parties to embrace a plank of suffrage as part of their platform. And so the very next year when women were able to vote, we elected three of those four political parties in um, with a women rep woman representative. And we had the Republican, Democrat, and Populist parties represented for that very first year. Now I want to say um, the Idaho State Historical Society and the archives were kind of to enough to prove, uh, to give us some images to show today to talk about some of the important things that, have, that happened in around that time. Um, what the first one is Emma Drake, um, one of those early original um, legislators. Mm -hmm. Why was she so important? So Emma Drake was, I believe, the fifth or sixth legislator if we were counting. She came in in 1919 and she was only one of two women legislators elected during that session. It was the 15th session. And she ended up sponsoring the legislation that Idaho submitted ratifying the 19th Amendment to the Key. U.S. Constitution. So fitting that it was a woman who did it mm -hmm. too. You know, to, to make sure that that momentous thing happened mm -hmm. with the pen of a woman and um, her being the sponsor of mm -hmm. that. The next thing we have is um, an important message or uh, what was the word you used for it? It was an, a, address. an address mm -hmm. that delivered by Governor D.W. Davis to the state legislature. This is the actual document that you have in the archives and it's on the digital file right now that people can look up online. We'll tell them how they can find that in a little bit, but what's the importance of this document? So this address is what Governor Davis delivered to the Senate and House during the special session of the Idaho legislature in 1920, before they took this historic action to ratify the 19th Amendment. And his language really speaks to the importance that um, Idaho was ahead of, the t ahead of its time. And they were recognizing that on this state they were making history by extending that vote and the right to vote uh, to women nationally. And Janet, the third one we have is um, a pretty cool piece of uh, an artifact um, for the state in the uh, in the state museum's collection, I believe. Correct. And um, this is a banner um, from the suffrage <laughs> movement in Idaho. Uh, tell me about this. So it is a beautiful piece of silk with uh, painted imagery of the state seal on one side and then this was the banner that the women from Idaho carried at the march in Baltimore and it was in really t difficult shape. It was shattered and last year at the Idaho uh, Foundation for Idaho History's fundraiser they raised about $30,000 to restore this and this is being restored right now and it will be out on exhibit in August. How old was it? I saw the dates on there, 1896 to 1913. Is it date pre? 1913. Yeah, 1913. Okay. Yes. And so um, how did it come into the collection of the state? Margaret donated it to us, right? Do you remember what date? So Margaret Roberts donated it in 1930. Uh, she was a woman that was very involved in uh, 
politics and in suffrage. She ended up being one of the first state librarians for Idaho, uh, and she was active in Idaho's efforts to serve on a national scale to extend suffrage on the East Coast and throughout the country. Um, and she donated that in 1930. It was actually a piece that came from the National Council of Women's Voters, and she served as vice president of that organization in the 19-teens. Uh, Jen, how can people get involved um, across the state if they'd like to um, either directly involved or to be able to find out more about how to enjoy and, and experience some of these things that you have planned? Well, the Idaho Women 100 website, easy to just Google that and click into it. Just there's, Idaho Women 100? Yes. Okay. Um, and it is, uh, there's a calendar of all kinds of events going on throughout the year. So if organizations have an event that they want to post, it's free and they can get their information up there. There's a toolkit that gives information, um, draft resolutions and things like that if people want to do uh, uh, official proclamations in their community. And then all of the things that the agency is doing along with the Libraries Commission, the Arts Commission, other state agencies are on that website as well as the I, um, I Will and their events. So there's a wide range of things. So you're encouraging people still to continue to add to what is oh, being yes. done. Oh yes, yes. We That's call this sort of a collective impact model. Uh -huh. So everyone working together really makes this initiative very engaging and inspiring because it doesn't matter where you live in Idaho, you can get involved. So. And Hannah Laurie, uh, as a historian, what do you hope people get out of these things that you're so focused on this year? Well, I hope big picture, you know, people recognize that while women have enjoyed suffrage nationally for the last 100 years and for the last 124 years here in Idaho, that it really wasn't that long ago and it took an incredible amount of effort to make that change happen. Uh, and this was in a time before tele telephones, before television, before radio in some cases. Uh, and so that effort was really by pen and paper and that we have and hold the records of those efforts at the Idaho State Archives and it's available for anyone to come and look at. Well, we're going to take a time out now, but we have more to talk with you two about um, another really interesting, fascinating thing that is right now at the Idaho State Museum. So still ahead on Viewpoint, Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans and World War II. It's an Idaho story that's also part of a national story that's being told right now at the Idaho State Museum. A traveling exhibit takes a close look at when the U.S. locked tens of thousands of Japanese Americans in incarceration camps, one of them near Minidoka, Idaho. The images and the message of the exhibit, next. The President's Day Super Sale at Furniture Row is on now, and you don't want to miss it. Shop today and find amazing deals storewide on dining, living, bedroom, and mattresses. And best of all, the more you buy, the more you save. Save 100 bucks on every thousand you spend. Or score a free patio set when you spend $29.99 or more. Plus, seven years no interest financing. The President's Day Super Sale, only at Furniture Row. It's time to shake things up at breakfast. Sure, you could have the same old, same old, or you could bite into the Chicken McGriddles or the McChicken Biscuit. Get both for just three bucks and add any size coffee for a dollar. Disaster can strike at any time. For Idahoans serving in the National Guard and Reserve, the families are often affected when their service member is deployed away from home. Fortunately, there's an easy way for Idahoans to help service members and their families in times of crisis. Just enter any dollar amount on your Idaho tax form to donate to the Idaho Garden Reserve Family Support Fund. Your donation will support service members and their families when they need it most. Thank you for your support. We brought together the state's largest, most experienced team of broadcast meteorologists. Built a state-of-the-art weather center. Designed a brand new app. So we can always keep our promise to be your first alert. Seven first alert weather. Four local meteorologists. Better local weather. My life was in shambles, and I was trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces. AA not only keeps me sober, it helps me live a much better life. If you have a problem with alcohol, contact AA. It works for me. 
Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. More than 75 years ago, during World War II, our nation uprooted tens of thousands of Japanese Americans and put them in incarceration camps. More than 13,000 of those Americans were sent to a camp outside of Minidoka, Idaho. A traveling exhibit showcasing the stories, pictures, and personal items of those who were held in such camps is now open at the Idaho State Museum. KTVB photojournalist Kevin Esslinger got a peek inside and gives us a glimpse of righting a wrong. This story is an Idaho story, but it's also a national story, and I think it really shows us as part of a big picture of American history. We are standing in our newest traveling exhibit, Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans in World War II. When the war broke up, the prominent Japanese were picked up within 24, 48 hours. After Pearl Harbor, 1941, our president created Executive Order 9066, which forcibly removed Japanese Americans from the western states into war relocation camps. It's a really powerful exhibit. It tells a story of Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II. Uh, we actually have the traveling exhibit here, and we also have a local component exhibit that we've worked with with Minidoka National Historic Site. So we have panels and artifacts from Minidoka that tell that local Idaho story as well. I think in this exhibit, you will really see uh, how harsh life was as an incarcerated, but you'll also see the hope for the future on display as well through some of the artifacts. There's a very moving needlepoint on display that actually shows the landscape that uh, you saw every day while incarcerated. And I think that speaks to uh, that community that they were forming and the hobbies they had uh, even within the walls of the camp. The art piece you see behind me was actually made for a pilgrimage back to Minidoka by a former inmate there in 2004. The paper on the umbrella was tattered to kind of represent the hardship of everyday life at Minidoka, whereas the cranes on the other hand represent the hope, so kind of that juxtaposition between a very difficult life and the hope in human spirit. When they said that the FBI is going to come search the house of well, my grandfather, he says, well, we got to get rid of everything Japanese. There are some oral histories uh, within our interactive displays as well. So there's two touchscreen kiosks from the Smithsonian. We also have some very powerful graphics. We have one that shows every name that was incarcerated in Minidoka. It's nearly 12,000 names on display. It's the role of the museum to really tell these stories and to make sure our visitors hear it from uh, a trusted source as a museum, that there was parts of history that may be uncomfortable to talk about, but we give you the resources, we present that story, and you can walk away knowing more about our past. And writing a wrong, Japanese Americans and World War II is open now and will be on display at the Idaho State Museum through April 5th definitely worth checking out. Once again, my guests today are Idaho State Historical Society Director Janet Gallimore and new Idaho State Historian Hannah Laurie Hine. Um, Janet, so far, how has the reception been from the public to this traveling exhibit? Well, Doug, we've had over a thousand people come through the exhibit since it opened just about 10 days ago. And the numbers are one thing, but really I think the power and how the exhibit is impacting people is another. And I think this is a difficult time in our nation's history, and you can look at this exhibit through many lenses, through loss and pain and generational trauma that were experienced by the people who were there, to hope and perseverance as they worked and helped be partners in the community, to then finally apology and honor given to them by uh, President Reagan. Um, but I think no matter what your lens is, the, the real reason why museums are important in terms of telling these kinds of stories is because we provide information that allows people to think without being, without dictating what to think. And so your own personal introspection and reflection causes very deep emotional feelings, and that's what helps people learn, and that's what helps people think differently and act differently in the future. So um, it is really a powerful story, and what we hope is that everyone through their lens uh, just remembers and that's what we want. We want people to take away whatever whatever power they experience mm -hmm. but remember. I'm going to ask Hannah Laurie about the Minidoka site in just a minute but you, while well, we, that story was running, um, it showed the wall of names. 
and you wanted to touch on that. Oh my gosh, so when you come into the exhibit, um, there's just the wall of names of people who were incarcerated at Minidoka, so there's over 10,000 names on that wall, and it has much the same feeling as the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., where it is just, you are overwhelmed by the amount of people that mm -hmm. were impacted. So. Um, I highly encourage everyone to be able to experience the exhibit, and it is a great thing that the museum and the State Historical Society created the museum so that these kinds of traveling exhibits from the Smithsonian and other sources can come to Idaho so that people can see them where they might not have otherwise So that was to. in mind when the renovation was being planned? Exactly. So, so we'll, we have a whole series of things that we're planning for the next several years, and it gives people the opportunity to see something they might not otherwise be able to. So Hannah Laurie, what is still at the site at um, Minidoka, and can people go there and see it? Yes, yeah, so the site is located in Minidoka County. Uh, the actual location, if you were to look at it on a map or try to put it into your Google Earth or Google Maps is Hunt, Idaho. Uh, and if you go out to the site today, uh, they have reconstructed the original guard tower. So when you pull up, you can see that this really was a site where people were being watched and being uh, you know, within walls, essentially within barbed wire. Uh, there's a very beautiful new, new uh, visitor center there, but the site itself has original buildings, uh, including a uh, barracks and one of the mess halls. And they've also recreated what uh, was the uh, baseball field at the site. Um, with the, uh, the, the traveling exhibit and with that, what do you think it is the message that Idahoans or tourists from out of state or out of the country would take away from this? Well, I think it's important to remember, again, going back to the fact that this didn't happen that long ago, um, that a lot of the survivors that lived in these camps are still alive or their, their sons or daughters are still alive and that the trauma of that experience still exists within families today. Uh, and just recognizing that uh, it's a part of our past and how can we reconcile that through educational opportunities today. And Janet, um, you talked about the importance of being able to have something like that and having it in mind as the new, newly renovated Idaho State Museum was being planned. Um, how was the, the Idaho State Historical Society able to get that traveling exhibit here? Was it because of the strong connection with Minidoka or, or other factors? Well, a number of factors because we had purpose built the building to be able to have the proper environmental controls and security and all of those things that if you are bringing in collections from the Smithsonian, they want to make sure that they're going to a uh, great place. And then our staff uh, has to apply. We have to make the case for those exhibits to come to us. And so the Smithsonian we've had a long partnership with as, as well as the National um, endowment for the humanities and other federal agencies so we've had an ongoing collaborative with them but it certainly helped um, the story that we partnered with the National Park Service and the folks at Minidoka National Historic Site to be able to bring that local component to bear and the Smithsonian always likes that as well because you want to tell the national story but it becomes more meaningful and personal when there's a local story as well. Okay, we're gonna take another break um, and then we'll be right back. But as I mentioned earlier, Hannah Laurie is the new Idaho State Historian. Next, we'll find out what her focus is going to be. My fellow Americans, I stand before you today humbled because the President's Day Super Sale is on now at Denver Mattress. Right now, the more you buy, the more you save. Get 100 bucks off every thousand you spend. And check out the Doctor's Choice Plush or Firm, only $599.99. Or save up to 200 bucks on select purple mattresses and accessory bundles. And for the budget-minded, get the Summit Queen, only $189.99. Plus seven years, no interest financing. The President's Day Super Sale, on now at Denver Mattress. Got you a custom jersey. Thanks, man. Wait, it reads colon instead of colon. Ooh. You missed the accent. I know how you feel. I was missing my favorite games, but then I switched to DirecTV, and they also gave me this season of NBA League Pass. Now I can watch the NBA whenever and wherever I want. Hey, maybe next time, I'll bet your half-brother. Send me colon. <laughs> TV without NBA League Pass is just kind of TV. Switch to DirecTV to get this season of NBA League Pass and save an extra $120. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. Craziest thing just happened to me. I can suddenly hear what people are feeling expressed in a song. What a man, what a man, what a man. All I know is that one second I'm getting an MRI and the next second. Oh God, an earthquake. Complete strangers are singing their feelings out loud to you. Because of this new ability, I discovered that my best friend is in love with me. I think I love you. What? 
Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, now streaming. New episodes February 16th on NBC. Do you know what to do if you're stuck on the railroad crossing? Get out of your vehicle. If a train is not approaching, find the blue and white emergency notification system sign on the traffic signs at the crossing. For help, call the number on the sign and give them the crossing number so they know your location and can alert train traffic. Remember, find the blue and white to save your life. Well, I'm back with Idaho State Historical Society Executive Director Janet Gallimore and new state historian Hannah Laurie Hine. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to get to know Hannah Laurie a little bit better. So what is and what is going to be your focus as the state historian? So my role with the agency is to provide support to all of our work groups and also to serve as an outreach uh, and resource really to Idahoans and to other agencies here in the state. Uh, this year with the Idaho Women 100 initiative really kicking off and underway, that is going to be my focus. I'm going to be leading for the agency uh, on that project and, and for those programs. Um, and I think in the future, really having somebody in the seat of state historian uh, to help provide context and to help share the stories of Idaho within communities across the state and also to make sure that these stories are being told nationally is really part of what I hope to do as state historian. Uh, I'm coming into this role, I'm the fifth person to hold this title for the agency and I'm quite excited to be here. So big question, why do you love history? Gosh, I love history because it provides the, the resources and the tools and the language to to explain what's happening today uh, and to be able to make informed decisions about the future. Uh, I think history gets a bad rap because people think it's simply remembering dates or remembering names, but if you think about it from the perspective of, no, I get to discover something new in the work that I get to do every day, uh, I think that that's really exciting and I, I wish more people would look at it from that lens uh, as opposed to a requirement to just remember. You know, when I think of well-known women historians, I think immediately of Doris Kearns Goodwin um, and others, but who was your hero that perhaps led you into a profession of historian? So my hero is Dr. Patty Limerick. She was my advisor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she really changed the way people thought about history of the American West. She kind of took it away from this black and white idea of good and bad and them versus others and said, no, there's all of this gray area here to explore. And within that is where we're really going to get the nuanced stories of where we are today. Janet, I think you should be happy with your, or, um, I guess, should I ask you, you must be happy with the hire <laughs> of Hannah Laurie. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a critical position in our agency and, you know, we are delighted to have Hannah Laurie on board. and every single person on our team because each of them contribute to this body of knowledge and this enterprise of history that tells the story of all of us. Well, thank you both for being here today and sharing some of that history with us and letting people of Idaho know how they can share in it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. I'll see you tomorrow on today's Morning News and back here next week for another Viewpoint.